นี้นะครับก็ขอเริ่มพิธีการนะครับสำหรับนี้กันเลยนะครับ Distinguished like the first is aimed at bringing some of the world's leading scientists to countries such as Thailand, in which science and technology have such important roles to play in the country's social and economic development. Today, we are privileged to have with us Professor Peter Agra of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, United States of America. Professor Agra received a Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2003. Before I introduce Professor Arke for his lecture, may I first call upon the Vice President of Chiang Mai University, Associate Professor Kanan Anuman Rajapur, to formally start this afternoon's proceedings with his opening address. Professor Kanan, please. Chiang Mai University. As I mentioned earlier, 
The series of lectures is hosted by International Peace Foundation, and I would now like to call upon their representative, who is present here today, Mr. Christian Graf Schaffer, to say a few words on behalf of the Foundation. Mr. Graf Schaffer, please. Professor Tanan mentioned about 
Professor argued a little bit, so I just want to add on uh, some of his academic path that might be an example for a student who is the major audience in this room. Professor Arthur received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, as mentioned before, that in the year of 2003, he shared the prize with Professor McKinney. But the interesting academic path, as I mentioned, Professor Arthur received his bachelor in chemistry. It should be an equation for us here from Oxford College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But later on, he obtained his doctor of medicine, which is an MD, which means that he's a doctor. Besides being a scientist, he's a doctor. He obtained his MD from the Johns Hopkins University. School of Medicine in 1974. After that, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow and senior research with scientist at the University of North Carolina. Then he returned to John Hopkins in 1981, where at present he still work at this place. So as I said that this might be an example, a good example for a student here that being a doctor of medicine, see that he obtained the prize for chemistry, which means that anybody, anyone who are in, interested in doing something, especially find some value, some opportunity to explore what you are interested in. And then finally, you will get what you are looking for. So, for his work, that he got his Nobel Prize is quite interesting, but it seems to be very difficult for us here in this room to understand all everything for the major uh, role that he took in chemistry world. So today, what Professor Arke is going to give us a lecture is going to be on the other signs and, and the, this sign is quite important too that he contributes a lot uh, after obtaining the Nobel Prize. Today the lecture that Professor Arke will give us will entitle Science and the Protection of Human Rights. So you see that noble scientists and the human rights, somebody might think that this seems to be quite uh, weird for us. How come scientists have to be dealing with any human rights? Scientists are supposed to be in the lab doing some, let's say that uh, somebody said that uh, chemists are supposed to do the dirty work. I mean, dirty hand, not the dirty work, sorry, probably I used that, improper words. And dirty hand supposed to get a dirty hand, but right now uh, the scientists are going to play another important role dealing with humanities, dealing with human rights. So please give us a warm, very warm, please give a very warm welcome to Professor Peter Arger. Professor Arger. Yeah. That's still on. But we'll get 
still sent a little bit of feedback. Okay, can you hear me all right? Okay. So I, I, as I was saying, I, I, I'm very pleased to be back in the same way. I came here for the first time, not much more than the students who are here today. I had finished my diploma studies in Minnesota. I had just turned 21 years old. And I came to Southeast Asia to uh, visit, visit these sites, to meet the people, and to invite them in the culture. I came to Chiang Mai, to the Laos, I crossed the river at the right side. Chiang Mai, Chiang Mai, and it's been several wonderful days here in Chiang Mai. So I know what a wonderful place to be. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to come back. It's important to visit this place. 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 Now the topic of my talk today, um, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, is it's not going to be chemistry, it's not going to be science, but an important issue nonetheless. An issue which is it's reaching the importance to me. So it's the real gratitude that I, I, I thank our sponsors here at St. Mary University and for our, 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 our sponsors through the, the, the International Foundation for Peace for including me in the wonderful program. So I'll be reading some of my comments, it's a formal one, but some of them I'll be giving you straight, straight from my mind. And if I'm very fortunate, at the end of this, you're going to have some questions. I know students are shy. They think scientists and faculty are senior, mysterious people. But in fact, we were young ones too. And I think the questions you have and your concerns are very important because you are our students. Challenges to human rights are becoming a major threat to the welfare of society. While less developed nations have launched a target for criticism, human rights abuses perpetrated Science has the potential to bring people together. And the pursuit of human rights issues by scientists and all gaming women and modern participated in church dialogue with the public of these books that you're about on the human energy policy. And I'll begin my talk by telling you my own story, how I became involved in human rights. And I'll tell you about the Committee for Human Rights of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. A that I now share. I've been a senator of Norwegian, Swedish, immigrants who farmed Western Minnesota and the Dakota Territory in the 19th century. Education was important to those communities. And my father and I would study chemistry. He was a real chemist. He didn't just stop at his diploma. He became a professor of chemistry at a small college in Minnesota. Then, participated in a number of national committees interested in chemistry education. And as part of these committees, he met a number of very eminent scientists, including the late Dr. Lyman Pauling. Pauling is well known because he won the 1954 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the definition of the covalent bond. He's also well known because he won the 1962 Nobel Prize in Peace Prize for his role Mr. President, we have no right to test. 
Kennedy at the White House, President Kennedy, and this is Kennedy toward the head of the reception line, and falling as I came to the front, President Kennedy with a smile on his face, looked at by the falling to Professor Pauling, I understand you've been around here earlier today. She'd seen it on television. But he got the message. Kennedy signed the limited test ban treaty of 1962, which ended testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. A treaty which is still in place. And it was a very, very important example of how scientists, individual scientists, can change the course of history. Now, my father knew I was calling. He stayed at our house. I knew him when I was younger than you. I was about 14 years old. And he was a very jovial, expansive individual with a great sense of humor and a wonderful presence. And I, I've always carried these memories, thinking that someday I would like also to participate in activities that will lead to peace and the improvement of human rights. I think scientists have that ability. And they must use any occasion possible. Made it easy for me here by the, the dialogue to talk to you. But even occasions such as this in the White House should be used for these peaceful purposes. Now, a second experience I had in the medical school, so a little older than this, because I was in the early 20s working in a laboratory at Johns Hopkins. And this laboratory was a very interesting laboratory because it was run by the man who had a part of Costas, a Latin American uh, born scientist. Came to John Hopkins and assembled an international team of scientists to study the cell membrane. And I was very fortunate to be included in this group. And while the science itself was, was spectacular and exciting, the people doing the science were even more powerful and interesting than I could have ever imagined. I think a lot of times the public, seeing Hollywood movies, thinks the scientists are very stiff, and serious, a little bit dull. Have you heard the word nerd? Nerd, scientists, nerd. Well, not in that lab. The scientists I met there were very colorful. My best friend, Matt Bennett, was a surfer from Hawaii. Ignacio Sandoval was an anti Franco activist from Spain who had served time in prison because of outspoken activities against the government. Gianfredo Puca, a handsome and debonair Italian actor, became a scientist. What would an Italian actor be interested in doing? He wanted to solve the molecular basis of femininity. And he achieved this by the first purification of the estrogen receptor. These were really interesting people. But the reason I bring this up is because I think science brings people together from different cultures. Also in our group is Naji Saidun, a Palestinian who grew up in a refugee camp in the south of Lebanon. And Martin Siegel, a conservative Jew, from Brooklyn, whose family was active in the Zionist policy. Now, initially, they viewed each other with a little skepticism, but they could become the best of friends by working together with the Zionist What What are the chances that someone like Nadi and someone like Mark would even meet each other in the first of the outside of some kind of academic and scientific position? And so I always think of them as examples of science and bring people together, even people from possible cultures. Now, I did remember that that inspired me to do a career as a biomedical research scientist. And as you've heard in the introduction, we're very grateful for that. In our laboratory, we pursued the problem of how water crosses the membrane of the cell. So, let me get a little audience participation here, okay? This will tell me if you wish to. How many of you know that our bodies are mostly water? Raise your hand. Okay. So most people don't know their bodies most of the Okay, so listen up. Our bodies are mostly water. This glass is filled with water. So this is entirely water. But me, you see me here? I have two-thirds water by mass. 75 kilograms, but two-thirds of that mass is water. And guess what? Same is true of these These plants here, the microorganisms that we can't even see, Trees outside are primarily water, about two thirds of the mass of water. Water is regarded as the salt of life. Life is impossible without water. But the barrier for the movement of water are the membranes of the cell. You get a fourth body in your eye. What happens? Tears form. If you get hungry and you see some smell, the delicious food, it's 
inside of it, it leaves the lion. If you're hot, if you're stressed by the heat, you'll sweat. The kidney compresses straight through. And the mechanism for this is the plumbing system that allows us to have I even said this is a little bit of a system. The plumbing system is a series of working for our performance in the And the flow out of the land is the case. The last one got me in the land is the case. It's a little bit of a system. So, the National County of Science is an interesting community. It makes up very serious, very, very limited and, and remote. But in fact, there are similar counties every country. The Thailand is a county of equivalent of the county of science, where individuals who are the teachers of the science and the aggressive are able to develop tests. So, the committee that I represent is one of the standing committees of the National Academy of Science, which looks out for when you're violent, you become a scientist, a engineer, or health professional around the world. This committee was initiated in 1976, not long after my visit to Japan last time, because of human rights abuses that were occurring around the world. The Argentina, the Dirty War. How many of you have heard of the Dirty War? Okay. So, scientists were singled out for punishment because they asked questions of the government. And the Soviet Union dissidents were just at that hour. Uh, Andrei Sakharov uh, were, were imprisoned in Gulags. And this committee was formed to, to stand up for them and seek their, their release from prison and their punishment. So the committee adheres to the doctrine of universal, uh, the universal doctrine for human rights. It's something, the document has been translated into more languages than any other document. 330 last, last year in his book of records. And this committee began with a handful of cases of volunteer staff and minuscule budgets, and its activities have broadened over the years, and the caseload has increased. Uh, in addition to looking out for the well-being of individual scientists, the committee has included now some science issues, such as the improved detection and clearing of antipersonal landmines. This is a big importance here in Southeast Asia, not in Thailand, which is also a peaceful country, but across the border from Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, there are still unexploded landmines there that are every year taking a toll on the most innocent people out there. Other issues that they, uh, the committee has taken on to evaluate are the health hazards of female genital mutilation, which is in the past common places of parts of Africa. And the need to respect human rights uh, while responding to terrorism. The importance of protecting scientific communication from political manipulation. Governments are not always sincere and benevolent. They sometimes would like to manipulate science for bad purposes. So in, in 1993, the, the National Academy of Sciences was joined by the, two other members of the National Academy, the Institute of Medicine and the National Engineering Academy. And it is joined by 1,600 correspondents and the members of the county who will write letters when the need arises on behalf of an individual who is human rights are violated. So the committee does not accept government funds, and this is important, to be totally independent and to provide advice to the government in scientific and technical matters. It's important to be independent because if you're not independent, you can always have your support back. Our support comes from private foundations, fundraising, which is difficult, but, but it gives us a totally independent approach to the issues we feel are dealing with. Generally, our intervention on behalf of individuals are low key, the point, but the firm and persistent. The committee never quits if it judges that a scientist and their health professional somewhere in the world is being uh, uh, unfairly imprisoned. They will persist and tell the individual to leave. We also attend colleagues who receive death threats. We urge the prosecution of colleagues who have been killed for political reasons. And we've recently begun to investigate cases in the United States when it appears that colleagues, regardless of the other independents, are not being treated justly in accordance with U.S. Bill of Rights. So far, of the 29 years of the history of this committee, 670 colleagues from 65 different countries have been released from imprisonment because of the actions of the committee. It's very common to this committee. Now, there's also a network of academies, similar academies around the world. And this was, this was started about 12 years ago. 
weeks, every other year, they will meet this spring in London in a meeting sponsored by the Royal Society. Now, Thailand is not part of this. I think it would be very good if Thailand were a participant in the network. And while the students, of course, will not be able to talk with this, the faculty and other scientists here in Thailand, if they wish to consider speaking to their colleagues, I'd be glad to put them in touch with the International Network Secretariat. I think the viewpoints of Thai scientists, engineers, and health professionals would be very useful to the rest of the world. Professor Dibran and 27 members of the staff were arrested in June of 
was important. This international network was important in the release of each other. Laos, how about Laos? Who's been to Laos? Many of the young people been to Laos? I see some hands in the back. Young people like me, I guess. <laughs> okay, let me tell you, you can get to Laos by taking the bus to Chiang Mai, transfer to Chiang Mai, the way across the river. It's not so difficult. It's a very interesting country, but it's a country with many problems. Again, we're very fortunate here in Thailand. In Laos, there are a number of big problems involving even high-ranking government ministers. Kao Kui Laos, I mean, an economist and former minister in Laos, has been in prison for 14 years simply for criticizing the government's economic policies. Our committee has been steadfast in its, its, its intervention on its behalf, particularly since the Selman, and another government minister, died in prison because of a lack of good medical care and poor prison conditions. By petitioning through UNESCO for its release and in calling the Laos government officials, uh, Dr. Matsami was finally released just, just three months ago. He's going to family in France and he's seeking medical treatment. China, okay, this, this part of the world has some problems. China, a blast of a physicist and democracy advocate wearing a tie, was released from Chinese prison on a medical medical role because of a heart ailment. After serving half of an eleven year sentence, his sentence was because he tried to peacefully register the China Democracy Party. This was, was not permitted. They had to release him as problem from the United States again for medical treatment. Now, problems are not unique to the, to the, the Middle East or to Asia. I'm going to tell you a bunch of examples from the Western Hemisphere. Guatemala, the Supreme Court of last year ruled that upheld and upheld the conviction. Uh, of a colonel in the National Guard who confirmed his 30 year sentence. He was convicted of instigating the murder of a Guatemalan anthropologist, Dr. Murder Man, who was stabbed to death repeatedly. He was stabbed to death uh, outside her office at the, the Social Sciences Research Center for publishing a book with Georgetown University Press. And in this book, they documented the desperate plight of the indigenous peoples of Guatemala. This was not a popular issue for the government. They didn't want other people to know that some of the indigenous people suffered badly. The Committee on Human Rights sent several missions to Guatemala following the murder and issued uh, case reports uh, and, and, and intervals of about five years. And uh, we remained greatly concerned. Now, the, the Colonel had been returned to prison that her sister, Dr. Mack's sister, is a was pivotal in ensuring that the case moved forward, has also been receiving death threats. And, uh, we were watching closely. We invited her to come to the United States to seek asylum. Well, Cuba has a number of human rights violations that have been very, very uh, uh, highly publicized in the late press. Oscar Mano Espinosa Chepe was one of a group of 75 dissidents brought to trial in March and April 2003 in a major crackdown on the agreement of the Cuban government. He was charged with activities against the integrity and sovereignty of the state. So they take charge. Basically, they, 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 they charge with receiving money from abroad, collecting press clippings about meetings between representatives of the United States and Cuban dissidents. He was convicted on April 3rd, 2003, following a summary trial, again, lasting only a few hours, failing to meet international fair trial standards. He was held in a cell with multiple common criminals and experienced defining opportunities now, Mr. Espinosa was granted parole, medical parole, on his 64th birthday. This is, this is past November, after serving 19 months of a 20 year prison sentence. And he wrote a letter to our committee. I'm going to read the part of this letter because it's so heartwarming. It has been, my, been an honor and a privilege to receive the support and follow up during my prison. And you are the outstanding scientist which you represent. And I assure you that no words are enough to express my gratitude. I'm convinced that you have contributed in a very decisive manner to my case. All the best for the members of your committee and the members of the, of the academies and the international network. Now, Mr. Espinosa has been released. However, he's been released conditionally, warned that he repeats crimes, these alleged crimes, for which he's not guilty, he's been sent right back to prison. 
Now the United States has long been viewed or is very prominent role in, in the human rights around the world. But I'm going to tell you about some issues which are very concerning to me and others in the United States. First off, scientists are uh, they denied the rights to free communication and scientific exchange. Just one month ago, the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets reported several dozen U.S. scientists that they was criminal prosecution that they attended an international symposium on death and coma and death in Cuba. Foreign scientists invited to meet in the U.S. Foreign students wishing to attend or return to universities in the U.S. are sub subjected frequently to visa restrictions. These measures are incompatible with the spirit of free scientific exchange and they undermine the ability of the United States to maintain its leading role in society. I'll tell you about two specific cases, and these are very, very shocking cases that uh, really, really do not protect well for my country. The first is the case of Wen Ho Lee. Wen Ho Lee was born in Taiwan and became a naturalized US citizen a computer scientist who worked in a classified laboratory at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. Now, in the late 1990s, when the United States had introduced the Trident missile system, okay, these are these are missiles launched from submarines. They have, they have very small warheads that are very powerful. And intelligence indicated that the Chinese government had developed similar weaponry. And the concern was that information had been leaked from the United States. Dr. Lee was repeated, repeatedly interrogated by the, the FBI, threatened with execution by the agents if he did not confess to crimes he suspected of passing classified documents to the people who covered the China. An intense smear campaign occurred due to selective re leaks to the U.S. news media. Dr. Dr. Lee was referred to in, in, in the news press and on the television the greatest spy of the 20th century. He was eventually arrested and charged with 59 federal felony charges, federal felony counts, so and brought him 39 life sentences to be convicted. Now, before the trial was even held, Dr. Lee was held without bail for nine months in solitary confinement, shackled, and to foot under conditions of extreme deprivation. Now, due to part of the actions of the Committee of Human Rights, as well as the large efforts of a number of Asian American groups, Dr. Dr. Lee's case was, was, was put forth for independent review of the charges. During this independent review, it was determined that Dr. Lee's actions were simply that he downloaded for backup purposes the mathematical code which he worked for years to develop. Shockingly, it was also discovered that the computer files on which the case was based had only been reclassified in secret after his arrest. A member of the government laboratory revealed that targeting of Dr. Lee occurred because he was of Chinese ethnicity, and no evidence of disloyalty existed. The independent reviewing magistrate concluded that the charges were unjustified, and the government was free to release Dr. Lee if he agreed to plead guilty to a single minor charge. They, 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 they insisted on saving face. He had to kind of invest in something and he invested a very minor issue to play one of the computer files which had no permanent information whatsoever. So while well, legal experts believe that Dr. Lee would have certainly been cleared of all charges had, had the trial occurred, he chose to plead guilty to the minor charge because he was immediately released from prison. And if he had undertaken the trial, there was a chance that he could have been sentenced to life in prison. Possibly would have been a million dollars or more. Now, a very, very unusual, in fact, unprecedented event occurred at the final hearing. The magistrate in the case issued a formal apology to the Dr. Lee on behalf of the entire nation of the United States for what had been a gross misdeed on the part of the U.S. Department of Justice. I'll tell you about a second case. Again, very egregious abuse of human rights that occurred in the United States. And I'll tell you about this case because it's really the case that can
plate is on the The plate is the, is the organism that it should be. The cell is the cause of black death in the Middle Ages. And still causes horrible, horrible illness around the world. That's not often in the United States. The top of the pair of children is plate in the Middle Ages. And when he, he, he finished his, his duty in the Navy, he came back to more training because he wanted to become an infectious diseases expert. He dedicated his life to investigating horrible diseases and the point of countless individuals in the third world. So I knew that the first of the students in South Carolina, when I was a medical intern in residence at Cape Western University in Cleveland, for time with an attending physician in the back of the room, and I was one of the house officers. We worked together closely, and I can assure you, he was a thoughtful, dedicated, caring physician who, who gave, gave all of his professional time to studying the infectious diseases of the third world. Now, as I mentioned, plague is not common in the United States, but a month ago, the news, you may recall, 61 died from the news. Suddenly, it became ill and died of plague pneumonia, which is in the vaccine in Chicago. Despite advances in the treatment of drum infections in West Bay, treatment of plague remains fairly old fashioned. No advances in the treatment of plague have been, have been established since the 1960s. But the fear of the plague that is still being used as a bioterrorism weapon has made it a concern of the U.S. Homeland Security efforts. The top offer obtained funds from reputable funds in the country to, to obtain plague specimens from infected patients in cancer and kidney death and transport them to the South America and the South America to be tested. So this is a difficult trip. Kind of me and Billy were both. And the outback is very remote. He undertook this with some risk to himself. But working with the Tanzanian government physicians, he obtained the tissue sample and brought them back to Texas for scanning method. He pulsed it in his laboratory and returned out of to his colleagues in Tanzania, where in fact the organisms belong to the Tanzanian government uh, in health industry. Tom also provided Dalekwaza culture to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. In fact, it's a well-known government agency laboratory that were very eager to obtain the access because they considered it a very important issue to identify the best medical treatment for plague. Now, in January of 2003, Tom noticed a rack of the organism missing from the laboratory in South Carolina, and he notified the safety officers. Now, I've run a research laboratory now for more than 20 years. We have thousands of samples. We try to be very organized. To lose a single bag is not a good Nevertheless, he did the proper thing. He notified the safety officers. Fearing that, the university officials were by the local police, who then called the FBI. This triggered an immediate alarm to the Department of Homeland Security. CNN News covered this why President Bush was alerted. 60 FBI agents swarmed the Department of Homeland Department so they interviewed all personnel and initiated a major search. The agents questioned Tom and Trusted him to try to remain in small community without a higher pressure. Finding no evidence of a break in it, it suggested a simple explanation that the samples were accidentally incinerated in a routine lab system, but not exploded in the water. A plausible explanation. Now, the agents stated that Tom signed a document recollecting recollect the destruction of the lab samples Now, Tom did not recognize this event, but he was persuaded by the FBI to sign the document. And after signing, he was arrested, handcuffed, taken to jail for himself without bail for six nights, charged with lying to the FBI. And, and lying to the FBI is an allegation that can neither be proven nor disproven. Sensing the weakness of their case, they also had 14 additional charges, including failure to transport organisms in compliance with the new restrictions. So after September 11th, the old routines were no longer the, the uh, approved routines. And Tom had not become modern in the transport of the organism. And there were multiple other unrelated issues, including tax abuse. Apparently, he lost the receipt for a car rental in Africa. He was charged with tax abuse. He was pressured by the FBI to confess and serve a six month prison sentence in the Now, why would they identify and sign this? In this way. At the same time, the United States 
cases, there was a horrible series of poisoning and blackmailing, and yet an unidentified animal. The FBI was and is frustrated in this case, but presumably they were under pressure to make some crackdown and fire terror. But knowing the weakness of the case, uh, and Tom knowing his innocence, he comes to fight this in court, and the FBI searched for any possible reason that they could bring the initial charges against Tom. And they pressured the Texas Tech University to file charges because they learned that the costs of these studies in Africa were borne by checks sent directly to the South Butler Home. And these, these monies were spent in Africa. The university did not share on these. And the reason they could charge file charges is because the university administers funds, they, they received some fraction of the money, about 30 percent. So it was 54 additional felony charges, supposedly for embezzlement were laid upon the shoulders. Now, if you add up all the charges, he, he was facing 69 federal felony counts, which is a volume of prison sentence of 469 years, simply because of the family who disappeared from his life, which probably were of no health risk. Now, the committee of the University of Minnesota on behalf of Tom Butler by activating Washington, D.C. constitutional law experts Jonathan Shirley and his legal firm, who served as pro bono advisors during the trial. The trial lasted a month. It ended just before I went to Stockholm. It uh, ended in the winter of, of, of 2003, just, just before I went into early December. It was very confusing, and at the end of it, this long litany of charges and gentlemen. After the deliberation, the jury cleared Tom Butler of all serious charges related to play, play the cell sample. He was convicted of three, three charges relating to the FedEx strip of the sample. He failed to adhere about safety sticker on the side of the styrofoam box. He checked the wrong box in the FedEx form. And he failed to make a telephone call requesting permission to send these to Tanzania because now Tanzania had to reclassify as a terrorist nation because Al Qaeda apparently got some presence in Tanzania. No evidence, of course, of the Gulf the embezzlement charges were problematic because the jury apparently didn't understand them. He was convicted of some but not all of these. Now, the presiding judge of the case, under federal uh, sentencing guidelines, could have offered Tom nothing less than two years in prison. And he did so. But he was clearly sympathetic. His words at the time of the sentencing were that this defendant's export was not with evil or terrorist intent. It was done in the name of medical and academic research. It was provided to medical and academic personnel. And he added, the defendant's research and the discoveries have led to the salvage of millions of lives throughout the world. There is not a case on record that could better exemplify a greater service to society as a whole than substantial, that is substantially extraordinary. Thus, even though the judge was very sympathetic to Butler, he was restricted in what he could do. Could hand out, and he could not hand out as a sentence. Tom began serving a two year prison sentence on April 14th of last year. I visited him in his prison in Fort Worth, Texas, in November. He lost 40 pounds. His health was reasonably good, and his spirits were, were hanging on. So his lawyers have filed an appeal related to the grouping of these. Uh, and they have a belief by, by law to be very strong appeal. But the U.S. Department of Justice refused to allow Butler to remain outside of prison until the appeal is received. Again, very hard treatment for a very honorable and dedicated humanitarian. The lead in Butler cases serve as a grim reminder that human rights are not only temporized in the United States.
Well, thank you very much, Professor, for your thought-provoking lecture. You point out how scientists can take roles in the protection of human rights. Before inviting a question from the audience, may I first call upon Assistant Professor Hajanov himself of the Chemistry Department.
ได้ทำหนังสือไปถึงหน่วยรักษาความปลอดภัยของมหาวิทยาลัยว่าได้ทำตัวอย่างชิ้นเนื้อหรือตัวอย่างหายไปหรือตัวอย่างทางมหาวิทยาลัยที่ได้แจ้งแล้วก็เคลื่อนไปถึง FBI ในที่สุดนายแพทย์ตะเลิศก็ได้ถูกจับถูกกล่าวหาที่5ข้อเช่นมีการนำเข้าตัวอย่างเนื้อเยื่อและตะเทียจากแพนเนียที่ซึ่งเขามีทำวิจัยร่วมอยู่เข้าสู่สหรัฐอเมริกาโดยรถยนต์ส่วนตัวแต่มีเพียงสามข้อกล่าวหาที่ผิดจริงรวมถึงการที่ไม่ได้บ่งบอกในตลาดอาสนุกที่สนไปแพนเนียว่าเป็นตัวอย่างของชีวภาพแม้ผู้พิพากษาเองก็บอกว่าจำเลยไม่มีจุดประสงค์เพื่อก่อการร้ายหากแต่ทำมีงานของงานวิจัยเพื่อการศึกษาและการแพทย์เมื่อมีการสะทอนกลับทำให้โทษจากจำคุกหกเดือนรายเป็นสองปีในแพทย์บัตเลอร์ถูกจำคุกตั้งแต่เดือนเมษายนปีที่แล้วเมื่อเดือนพฤศจิกายนที่ผ่านมาศาสตราจารย์อาเรได้ไปเยี่ยมเพื่อนของท่านเพราะว่าน้ำหนักลดไปถึงสี่สิบปอนด์ในแพทย์บัตเลอร์ควรได้รับการช่วยเหลือให้ได้ทำงานต่อนั่นคือการช่วยเหลือชีวิตของผู้อื่นนั่นเองจะเห็นว่าแม้แต่นักวิทยาศาสตร์อเมริกันเองก็ยังถูกละเมิดสิทธิมนุษยชนขอบคุณค่ะท่านผู้ประโยชน์ทุกท่านขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะขอบคุณค่ะ And well, I will do my best to translate it into English for Professor Arthur to answer his Q and A. So, are there any questions? Yes, please. Uh, well, there's a microphone. Did you pass the microphone to you, please? But that's what happened to the beginning after you finished with them 14 years ago. What are you doing now? Okay. Jeff and the one What happened to you? Your associates. McKinnon. McKinnon. Oh. <laughs> what happened to New York is that we, um, I was the one who shared the ride with Robert McKinnon. He uh, and I um, worked at different topics. We worked on a small structure of a small channel that was
number five. Thank <laughs> you. 
Those who are not educated, you can vote with your, with your ballots in election. I think the last presidential election in the United States, the candidates have argued about many things, but there were some third differences with their science policy. I think by being involved in society, maybe even running for office, or providing opinions to candidates, we can educate those who are in control. Because government must be responsible for people that always benefit the case, and it's not often easy. I think some of our presidents have had greater presidents. I think Jimmy Carter actually had a lot of, a lot of good interest in science and humanitarian efforts. He wasn't so successful as a political leader. But it, that's not an easy issue to educate people who don't want to educate. Five foot 
testimony and inform me on the chemist part. And my own thought was chemistry. What do I know about chemistry? I'm a medical doctor. But I think the reason it was the chemistry part that Rod McKinnon, who I should be part of, was also a medical doctor, is because we identified proteins that control the movement of fluid in the cell, which is a biochemical process of importance. And no new disease treatments have yet emerged. We hope they will. I think, in fact, the medicine committee was also interested in this, and I'm glad that we learned that subsequently. But um, I think it's because it was considered biochemical. Now, interesting, in the year of 2003, we shared the trials, the medicine prize was awarded to two chemists. And these chemists, Paul Oliver and Peter Mansfield, developed magnetic resonance imaging and human tissue. So the committee sort of did a little switch. And I think you'll see that more and more. The discipline someone is trained in need not be the discipline they're working with. Like in the Renaissance, people follow their curiosity. So amongst the economic part, we have Rob Daniel actually studied the physics when he was a student. So sometimes we start in one area, but our work leads us into new areas. And that was an excellent question. Thank you.
for Bank of the Dead. So may I have why the Association of the Faculty of Science Association Professor Paul Asanajida to say a few words of uh, appreciation for Professor Arthur's lecture. Professor Paul, please.
This afternoon, light year will serve as an inspiration to us, all working in our various fields of science and technology to strive to achieve our highest ambitions for the behalf of the society as a whole. This now concludes today's proceedings. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the last in this year, 2004-2005 series of Nobel Laureate Science Lectures, all of which have been very well, well received. We look forward with anticipation for the next series in 2005-2006. Thank you very much.